Well, hey everyone, welcome to a new year. And I have to tell you before we start that, you know, we had to do the traditional joke, like when we're seeing somebody at the end of the year where we say, see oh, no. you next year when it's like tomorrow. And our kids are still at the age, they're eight and 10. And our kids are still at the age where they think that's funny. Perfect, perfect, <laughs> hold on to that. <laughs> and happy new year, how are you? Here, I'm good, how are you? I'm self-isolating these days. I don't know why, but you know. Are you? Well, I also got my third booster. Yeah. New Year's Eve. Did you have any um, symptoms or side effects with that? No. no. Excellent. Okay, good. How about you? And you're back from Banff. Yeah. And your trip. And okay, so if you guys don't follow Anne on Instagram, you need to. What are you at? Anne, anecdotes? Anecdotes. Yep. Follow Anne. Anne was posting some pictures of some ice sculptures, like incredible ice sculptures in Banff that people were like huge, like houses. And these were like huge. So um, anyways, guys, welcome. Welcome to our first episode of 2022 that we're recording. And I feel like we have new beginnings and I feel, I feel joyful today. I'm having a joyful spirit. I'm glad. Me I'm, too. I'm, and I'm feeling especially joyful because we were chatting with our guests for a while before we started recording. And um, boy, what a great way to start out the year. So let me introduce you, Mike, Mike Thirtle. How are you? Good morning, ladies. I'm doing well. Happy 2022 to you too. It's, it's feeling like 2021 a little bit, right? <laughs> it's, it's that purgatory in between time. That's right. It's a right? little bit. Yeah. Every year we hold out hopes that this year is going to be a little bit better. Right? So, um, and we were, before we started recording, we, st we were talking to Mike about Arizona, because Mike is um, based in Arizona here. And we were talking about Darcy Olson, which you guys might remember. She heads up Gen Justice down in Arizona, is doing incredible work. And we're huge supporters of her too. And Mike, I have to tell you. So Mike is actually the CEO of the Gary Sinise Foundation, which he's going to tell us all about. But basically, they support um, military members and their families and service members and veterans and are America's heroes, basically. And you're going to tell us all about that. And if you guys recognize the name Gary Sinise, then it's because he was an actor. Is he still acting, Mike? I don't even know. If he's yes, okay. he's a wonderful He's a wonderful that during our day. He's a wonderful and yeah, he's still acting. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, and I'm going to hearken back to our conversation with Colonel Jim McDonough that you guys might remember from way, way back a year ago, where we talked to Jim, who's heading up, who is a veteran. So Mike is a veteran of over two decades, um, yeah. which we're, we're excited to hear about your story. And Jim was as well. And he's heading up Headstrong, which is an organization that provides mental health care to veterans and their families. He's incredible. So go listen to that episode too. But Mike, we are very excited to have you on the podcast. And like I was saying, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I think Mike, it's partially because I didn't grow up in a military family. Like I'm just, um, I don't know a lot about kind of the ethos and Kind of the community behind it and so I love to learn more about this because I feel like embedded in this is all these hero traits that we talk about here on the podcast like service and empathy and courage and all those good things so I'm very excited to talk to you about that but Mike can you start by telling us about yourself where did you grow up a little bit about your history and then what led you eventually to the Gary Sinise Foundation yeah um how much time you get <laughs> 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 we got to uh, keep it under 10 hours. No. Okay. <laughs> this is the cliff notes version. Um, but uh, no, thank you so much for what you two are doing. And, and when I have a chance to listen to your podcast, I, I watch Darcy's Darcy's a really special lady and doing amazing things with John justice. I'm a supporter of her organization as well. Um, I thought, wow, these two are doing some great things here uh, in our community and society. And so I just want to tip of the hat to both of you. Thank you. For, for being uplifting spirits is what I will describe you both as. Um, and I get a good vibe even just being here. So thank you for starting my new year out this way too. So um, so I originally, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I'm a diehard Green Bay Packer fan. Oh, yep. And uh, I grew up in Northern Illinois, not too far from Lori, where I think you're at in the Chicago area. So I grew up in a town called Wakanda, Illinois. My dad was in the paint and wallpaper business. And uh, so I come from a long line of painters and wallpaper hangers. 
who also happened to be veterans. Hmm. And so my grandfather served in World War II. My dad was in Korea. Um, and I wound up being a veteran myself. My youngest brother is also. Um, so I went to the Air Force Academy out in Colorado Springs for, for college, undergrad. And so I was the first one in my family to be a military officer and a college grad. And so for me, it was an honor to represent that small community of Wakanda in the Northwest suburbs there of Chicago um, to go to a service academy. And I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think most kids who go to the academies, it's a, it's a different walk than going to uh, a four-year university. But uh, it was through the academy that I was commissioned as an officer in the Air Force. And I was stationed in Arizona and then Dayton, Ohio, where I worked on the F-15 fighter program as a systems engineer. Um, and I left the service as a captain. And I left because I had a different kind of calling to help the country was to go uh, do grad school, do my PhD out at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California. So I went out to Rand and did my PhD at Rand and uh, jumped back in the reserves at that point, served the country for another 17 years in the reserves. Mm -hmm. So my reserve service was always an additional duty, if you will, compared to my professional work. So I essentially had my professional life, which is mostly in consulting. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then my reserve service as a military officer, mostly in the Pentagon. I spent most of my time in the Pentagon up on the air staff. And then a third kind of quasi career I had was I, I was an adjunct faculty. I taught for close to 20 years um, at places like Northwestern there in Chicago. I used to teach a graduate school downtown in Chicago, night school in the public policy program and the, the business program there, and a few other universities across the country too, in more of an online mm -hmm. format. But uh, so I kind of had three careers simultaneously, if you will, mm -hmm. um, throughout most of my career. But uh, my most I, cherished was military. Can I ask, what does it look like to be um, a member of the reserves, of the army reserves, mm -hmm. as you're holding down another job? Like what, what yeah. are, um, you know, some of your, your jobs, expectations for time, et cetera. Very difficult. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so when I served, it was uh, 90. So in the reserves, I served active duty 90 through 95 and the reserves 95 through 2011, 2012 timeframe. And during that time frame, obviously 9-11 happened and other kinds of things happened. And so the military increasingly became busier and busier and busier. Um, with all the conflicts and being overseas. Mm -hmm. um, during the time that I was in the reserves, my professional life um, outside the military, which was my full-time job, was professional consulting. So I worked at Price Waterhouse Coopers as a consultant in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I worked at the Rand Corporation for about 14 years. Both places, both Price Waterhouse and Rand were always very, very amenable in terms of my military service. But literally what I did for my military service, I spent on average probably anywhere from 70 to 100 days a year in the reserves on doing some sort of a drill or active duty time frame. And I usually did that on the weekends and took all my vacations to do it. Um, I was never deployed, almost was to Bosnia back in 97, but it didn't happen. So I was never deployed for an extended period of time, but in terms of my service to country, it was my professional life and my military service. And that really encapsulated 365 days a year. So for me, um, there were no vacations, there were no weekends. And so it was pretty much just doing the military service to help the country out in that capacity. Not that that's a huge sacrifice compared to what you know our true warriors make, but for me to balance a professional consulting career at a top tier consulting firm with a military service was not a not an easy walk from my perspective. It was very difficult um, to navigate all that. Yeah. And so um, I just enjoyed serving. I enjoyed throwing on the uniform. I love helping the country. I still love doing that. Um, my work at RAND, honestly, was service to country. Um, and what RAND does for the country is amazing, helping the country with strategy and mm -hmm. thinking about the future. Um, but it was always kind of like, it was, it was difficult to walk through those two lives simultaneously sometimes mm. well and even as you're talking i'm thinking about how your your desire to serve mm -hmm. added this extra layer of 
of time and days, you're using days off, you're using vacation days to serve your country, right? So what were, okay, so I, you probably don't, I probably don't even know if I should ask this, but I'm very interested. Was there any like um, personal benefit to you oh, yeah. for serving? Um, not in terms of don't care about, um, just generally I'm thinking about what did you personally get out of it? You said that you love to serve, right? Mm -hmm. You put on the uniform. What was it about that that was so compelling that you wanted to add on this extra layer of responsibility on top of your day-to-day? -day? Yeah, for me, it's it's being part of the bigger whole. Um, it's, it's, it's linking to history too. I, mm -hmm. I truly believe that there's a few institutions in our country the military being one of those that can take you right back to 1776 mm -hmm. and and the history and the culture and the lineage and kind of how people think um, takes you right back to why we are who we are in this country today mm -hmm. and so when it comes to freedoms and liberty and and being able to cherish these really special things that you know the people set up a couple over a couple hundred years ago the military is one of those artifacts that without its presence we wouldn't have the beautiful country that we have today i mean i've traveled the planet um, in my consulting roles over the years and as much as i love to see other cultures in other countries i typically can't wait to get back here mm -hmm. because i just appreciate so much more about what people have done in terms of their sacrifice and their commitment and what they had to do to make things happen. Even during the toughest of times here in our, our nation's history, and we've been through some pretty tough times here the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has across the globe, but it's, it's really, it's a testament to our fortitude as a nation. I think it's about a social fabric to me. Um, when I look at other organizations, like what Darcy does at John Justice and some other colleagues that I have that serve, um, it's just not about military service. To me, it's always been about service. Yeah. I jokingly say, you know, when I hit 80 years old, I'm never going to stop working, but when I hit 80, I'm going to go join the Peace Corps because I, I literally think it's all about service, whether you're a teacher, yeah. a cop, a firefighter, military, yeah. whatever you do in life, you know, yeah. and if you're in the private sector, it's about service. Um, it's about how you can give back to the community. And for me, that was kind of instilled in me, I think, as a kid. Yeah. My parents were always very giving people and always wanted us, as my mom would say, she always said to me, Michael, I don't care what you do in life. Um, I don't care if you pump gas, but pump gas good. Um, no, right. <laughs> it was kind of not well, but good. But <laughs> <laughs> and I always cherish that because to me, it also harkens to my Midwestern roots and where I grew up as a in, in where I grew up uh, in the community. And uh, we were always part of the parades and Cub mm -hmm. Scouts. And I'm American Legion member. I've been in one for 35 years. And I truly believe I'm giving back. In fact, I'm working on our here in Phoenix, the post that I belong to, um, there's the Boys State and Girls State program here in Arizona. Back in Illinois, I went to Boys State when I was in high school. And that's a way for me to give back to the local high schools here is to work with the kids, you know, and help them. When I was back in Illinois, I actually had two reserve jobs, one in the Pentagon and one back in Illinois. And my job back in Illinois where I lived was I had a bunch of high schools that I go to every year to talk to, to high school students about the Air Force Academy or Air Force ROTC. I was called an Air Force Academy liaison officer. Mm -hmm. And so I had about 24 schools from Rockford West out to the Mississippi, all farm schools. And I loved going to those schools. It was a lot of drive, there. Um, but it was, it was great because I could see kids who didn't grow up in military families. I didn't really grow up in a military family, so to speak, even though my, I had lineage. Um, but uh, just going, because the, the nation's, you know, future is all across the country. It's not one mm -hmm. spot. And it's one thing I love about service in the military is it's all egalitarian. It's mm -hmm. truly, it's representative across the fabric of who we are and what we are. And it kind of harkens back to that, those early times in the 18th century. I have a question as a Canadian. <laughs> what is the, I'm like, help me. So what is a boy state and a girl state? Yeah, what that is, it's a, it's a program actually sponsored by by the American Legion. Um, in the state of Illinois, it's been around for, geez, I want to say like 80 years now. It was 50 years when I went to high school. Um, and what they do is you typically go to like uh, a university for a week and they draw kids from across all the high schools in the state. 
And they go there for a week to learn about citizenship and history and patriotism. And uh, you come out of it kind of like just with a different experience of learning about government. It's really kind of about government and public service. So, Mike, I'm hearing a lot of what you're saying is like kind of a civic duty, um, a civic knowledge and just general awareness that we're part of something bigger, right? <laughs> Even when you're talking about like the future is decentralized across this right. country. Um, and right now, Mike, I'm going to be honest, I, I think I sense that there's the civic, uh, generally, our sense of civic duty, pride, all that is a little bit, it could be stronger. I'll just say it that way. How do we, like, what are the keys to helping us to understand that as members of a country, whether it's ours or another, mm -hmm. like we are one people and we do need to work together. Because sometimes I think there can be the sense of, okay, the military, the politicians, the state level, a legislature, whatever, um, like they're doing their job. That's their job. My job is to simply critique it on social media or to do it. How do we begin to see that all of us are actually important of the, in this thread of civic life and making this country yeah. better? Well, I think what you two are doing right now is one example of that. I think, I think pulling on certain threads of, of, of commitment into helping people um, to me, a lot of this boils down to the golden rule, you know, treating others how you'd want to be treated. And, and it sounds simple, but sometimes the simplest things to say are the hardest things to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I truly believe that that's what kind of connects us in this fabric. I think, you know, you go throughout our nation's history, I can't speak to Canada's history, um, but I can speak to American history a little bit is is when you look at how things have ebbed and flowed, there's been great times and tough times. There's been difficult times and wonderful times. And I think the one thing that kind of has kept this, this country we call America, this experiment, if you will, as a republic together is that we're all in kind of this same boat together, you know, and trying to figure this out. And I think it comes down to respect. It comes down to being respectful of people's religious backgrounds and their political beliefs and just being respectful of them as human beings. It's really, to me, that kind of seminal is just being respectful to people. Yeah. And I think that's what really, um, I know in the military, I, I know that that to me is what held me and what I wanted to serve was to help other people. I know my brothers and sisters in arms, they, they all come to it for different reasons, but at the end of the day, it's about service to nation. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about working for Gary Sneeze and, and being at this foundation is that Gary harbors those same principles. I mean, the guy has been for 40 years of his life dedicated to veterans and our nation's heroes. You know, he didn't have to do that. He could have retired out of Hollywood and just done his thing like a lot of people do. Um, but instead, he decided to take another path. And that path was based upon his belief of service and giving back and being able to help people. Mm -hmm. And that's what drew me to this. I wasn't really even looking for a position, the search firm that was doing the hiring reached out to me. And the more I learned about the foundation and particularly about Gary, actually Gary's a Chicago one too. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys knew that, but he grew up in Highland Park. Um, and when I learned more about him and have had a chance to, to, to really get to know him better, he's an amazing human being. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really attracted to amazing human beings. Mm -hmm. I, I love smart, good people. That's the mm -hmm. simplest way for me. When I used to teach leadership at Northwestern, Lori, I used to tell my students, um, I'd come up with a simple quadrant. I'm like, I want to hang out with the smart, good people, you know, because um, because that makes life wonderful. You know, it doesn't have to be smart and cutthroat. Yeah. It's smart and good. And I've, I've been yeah. in some pretty competitive environments in my life, but I, I love an environment where people are trying to yeah. row in the same boat <laughs> together and makes, make a difference. Um, Mike, can I say something too about like smart, that smart, good quadrant? I like that. Um, and I want to get more people into that quadrant <laughs> because I think sometimes people think that they're not smart enough to do something, right? Or people who are smart are in their own bubble and then they don't think into the good territory as well. How do we help people 
cross that cross into that quadrant? Yeah. Well, I think it starts early on in one's life. Um, I also think people can go from A to B in different kinds of ways. You know, I think one of the great things about the United States or Canada or any free nation is that you can go from A to B in different kinds of ways. I think for me personally, I mean, what I've always tried to do over the years, I've never had any formal mentor, so to speak. Um, I never had people who took me under their wing. At least I wasn't aware of that. Uh, to me, it's always been seeking out people. It's been seeking out people who, to me, fit that quadrant. And, and I emphasize the good over the smart, to be brutally honest. If I had to pick or choose at the end of the day, I'd take good over smart. Um, and not everybody chooses that. you know. And I, I can kind of understand it to a certain extent. But I think in our society, we tend to value smart over good sometimes mm -hmm. um, a little bit too much. And I think to me, it's more about if you've got an open heart to things and you want to be able to focus your energies, your talents, you know, whether it's time or money or whatever it is um, in the right direction, you can make make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm trying to do my, my little bit here um, to help out. And I hope I am. I hope when I look back, you know, when I joined the Peace Corps in 30 years, um, I can look back at this car and go, did I make that difference? You know, and mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not to get spiritual or anything, but I think there's a there's a domain there, too, about service yeah. that kind of that focuses on that domain, um, which is universal. Yeah. yeah, It's not unique just to our country, obviously, but I think it's I think it, I, I look at it as a responsibility. I think if I had to boil it down, it's a responsibility to help yeah. people. And, not yeah. walk this past people, past people, but put your hand out to help them. That's a great, that's a great imagery. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to, Mike, I want to high um, hop to the Gary Sinise Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I want you to educate us a little bit here. Yeah. But I want to start with one of the phrases um, that you have on the website, which I really, really like is, is you say, while we can never do enough for our defenders and their families, we can always do a little bit more. And I think that came from Gary Sinise himself, yeah. we yeah, can always right. do a little bit more. And I think that's a great rallying cry mm -hmm. for where we're at now. Um, and so tell us about what that looks like with in the work that you're doing. And then Mike, I would like you to educate us a little bit on kind of the trauma and the different obstacles that those who serve in the military are facing. And then maybe how you're meeting those needs and just what we need to know in that area. So those two things, tell us a little bit about the foundation. Absolutely. Um, so Gary, Gary's been at this for literally 40 years. Um, foundation was started 10 years ago. Gary founded that out of uh, Los Angeles. And really our mission is rooted in a deep history and his personal walk to raise spirits, to improve the mental health of our nation's defenders, our veterans, our first responders, um, so not just veterans, but also first responders, and, and especially their families. And so our programs, which I'll talk a little bit about, are truly anchored around those principles. And so we're here to entertain and educate, inspire and strengthen, and to build communities. And I love that phrase, build communities, because we can definitely strengthen ties amongst people. Um, when we talk about doing a little bit more, as Gary says, um, it's really the spirit, spirit of service. Mm -hmm. which is kind of the, I think, the theme of our discussion today. And it's really the bedrock of our foundation's programs. Um, so, for example, one of our programs, we call them PILLARS, is called the RISE program. And RISE is an acronym that stands for Restoring Independence and Supporting Empowerment. And essentially what we do is we build homes, uh, specially adapted smart homes, mm -hmm. all operated with the help of an iPad. In fact, I've done two home dedications now. And at these home dedications, you don't hand the key to new homeowner, you hand them an iPad, mm. which, which I think is fantastic. That is. Um, and being able to restore independence. I just did a home dedication in San Antonio back on Veterans Day. While Gary was on Fox and CNN and Good Morning America that day, I was out in San Antonio doing a home dedication. And it was for Jason Tabansky and his wife. And Jason um, was, was hurt, has been paralyzed from the sternum down. And this is truly a home for them where he and his wife have an opportunity now to have a family hmm. and do things that they couldn't do before because the situation they had for their, for their residential situation was not accommodating, whether it was specially adapted, you know, shower or kitchen or 
hallways. So we do that. So we build homes for veterans and first responders. We also have a program called Relief and Resiliency. And in that program, we provide mental wellness help to people. Mm -hmm. um, we also do something we call Snowball Express. We just did it right before Christmas. And what Snowball Express is, it serves children of our fallen military heroes and their surviving parents and guardians through year round activities. And one of the things we do in particular is a five day trip to Walt Disney World. Mm. Where we fly all these families and kids down. And some of this is on our website. Um, and we couldn't do it live this year because of COVID. So we did it virtual. But we fly them down there and they have all kinds of cool programs. You can imagine a kid who's never been to Walt Disney World, even if you have been, um, being there and being able to see all the characters and Gary and the band perform and they get to go in the amusement park. And it's just a wonderful uh, opportunity to share. Um, we also do what we call Invincible Spirit Festivals, where the Lieutenant Dan Band, which Gary leads, mm -hmm. you get out and they play. We just did a concert up at Nellis Air Force Base in November, the first, actually the only concert we did in 2021. And uh, we had about, I don't know, 2000 people there at Nellis. Um, we put on the, the show for them. American Airlines flew in veterans as well. We have some great sponsors like American Airlines and Home Depot and Walmart. And it's one of the wonderful things about this mission is we have wonderful partners who truly believe in the same thing we do to support people. Mm -hmm. Um, Gary's also big on community education, so it's a third pillar. And one of the things that we've done with COVID, it's been had to be shut down. We do this thing called Soaring Valor, where we sent World War II veterans down in New Orleans to tour the World War II Museum. Mm -hmm. And we partner them with students because we believe in this legacy issue of being able to take that knowledge and transfer it to other generations. Um, we also serve heroes through uh, food distribution. Um, we do... Literally just a couple of weeks ago, we were out at Point Magoo, uh, west of Los Angeles near Ventura, California, and did a Serving Heroes. We provide meals to our service members. We did one over in Korea, too, over the Christmas holiday. And in many of these, Gary will actually work the food line. He'll serve food to people. Um, and uh, like many of us who served, that hot meal can make a difference between a lousy day and a really good day. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a big deal to a lot of people. Um, we also do a lot of first responder outreach to help our police and fire uh, sisters and brothers out there with help. One of the things we're doing right now is we're staying up a couple new chapters in San Diego and Orlando. And uh, we hope to do more of these kinds of chapter outreaches in the future as well. Mm -hmm. And in San Diego, for example, they just did an event a couple months ago for a 911 dispatch center. Um, where they went to thank those people for working the phones. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unsung heroes here that we don't really think about, you know, where when you make the call to 911, you're talking to somebody on the other line who could be your lifeline, you know. Mm -hmm. So our wonderful chapter volunteers in San Diego said, you know, we're going to do something for the dispatch center folks. And they went and served them lunch that day, just say thank you. So you can imagine being in a dispatch center where there's video prompts. It probably looks like an air traffic control center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're just there. And, you know, people don't know who you are. And so you got this group of people come in with the Gary Sinise Foundation logo on and through Gary saying thank you to these folks. And it's a touch. One of the things that brought me here, um, well, what brought me here was the mission to be able to see how we touch people. And I use the word touch because when I saw how Gary has done this mission for 40 years, it's a touch mission. It's about him being in a hospital at Walter Reed and kneeling next to a bed and praying with somebody, touching them, saying, it's going to be okay. We're going to help take care of you. You know, and it's like my previous organization where I was helping people with autism and Down syndrome across the country, um, that was a touch mission where I'd walk into one of our group homes and get hugs from these guys with down syndrome and they're just beautiful people you know and you just want to be there to help them and touch them and gary truly does that in this mission um serves people in a, in a selfless kind of way and I, I think i'd leave you that too with service comes selflessness and that's truly what gary's about and how he's done things over the last four decades yay thank you so much mike really 
that's a lot, but uh, I would really encourage everybody to look at your website because I was checking out your website and it was really inspiring as well. Um, just even the photo of the person that got the home um, basically retrofitted for, for yep. him to be able to move around easily and actually live in his own home well. So that was really amazing. And that's just one aspect of what you were just talking about. I think it's really cool. <laughs> Obviously you see Gary um, on TV or in films throughout your whole life. Like, I think I grew up watching him on screen and then knowing this other side is really inspiring as well and, and wonderful. So I'm really glad 40 years is a dedication and your life too is like, a whole life of dedication and the cool thing about what Lori has created here with hero makers is she's created and written up nine traits of a hero maker and so I really think that the the trait of sacrifice really applies to everything that you're talking about and basically this seems like the theme of this call is sacrifice is offering whatever you have for the sake of another and I really feel that's what you've done in your life, um, even just with high school or high school students and, and helping them understand all the way up to going to the World War II uh, Museum with uh, different generations and showing them that this is not just history, it's reality and it's, it's today and it's current and it's important for us to learn. Um, so I just wanna say thanks for all that you're doing and the sacrifice you've taken early for your country over obviously it's a high priority to you and so it's obviously then something you're really passionate about and that comes out really clearly so so thanks well, thank you ann um i i feel like i'm just small little <laughs> drop in the ocean here but I, I think i think you know the more people like you two are suggesting that more people give back and try to assist i think it's it's great. It's just, it's, it's, I feel blessed to be able to work in an organization, work for a guy who sets, sets an example, you know, and that's something I appreciate too, is setting that example of not just talking about something, but um, actually going out and doing something about it. And I think that's the difference here with our foundation is we're going out and doing things. It's, it's getting out there to help people and we want to help a lot more people. Um, so my, under my leadership here to help Gary and our board and our team is to figure out, how to help a lot more people. And we're gonna do that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really excited as 2022 comes into focus here of how we can support a lot more people out there in the veterans and first responder space. There's a lot of veterans organizations, um, but there aren't a lot of organizations that support first responders when you get down to it. And there's a lot of people out there who need help, especially okay. in the mental health arena and uh, there's all kinds of issues to tackle. We, we could spend the whole call just talking about that. Um, Mike, you know, as you were talking, I was having this imagery of gift giving. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we had somebody on the podcast who started this organization called Beverly's Birthdays. And she would, um, there was, she had met this, this child who had never had a birthday party thrown. Mm -hmm. And so she developed this whole big initiative that she would throw birthday parties and put together gift bags for, um, for all these kids who had never experienced a birthday, right? Because they were like growing up in poverty, et cetera. It's right. like this perpetual gift giving cycle to people who didn't, weren't expecting it. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about kind of the surprise element that these are people who have served um, and their family members, right? Like the, the kids mm -hmm. in Disney World. Um, but these are people who have served and maybe who aren't really expecting to be cared for and be given this gift. But like that, like, wow, how amazing it is that somebody remembers me, that somebody's thinking about me. I think there's, right, the human spirit is we want to all be acknowledged. We want to all be known and we want to all be understood. And so <clears throat> kind of what you're doing is you're validating people, them as people. And I think that's really powerful. And so um, I want to, Mike, I want you to, to talk to us a little bit about, um, like, allow us to go through some of what they go through in terms of the trauma that some of them could experience and 
the lasting effects that that could have on them. Can you can you explain? You give us like a a little bit inside of look of what it's like to go through um, service and some of the traumas, psychological, physical, whatever it is. What do we need to know that maybe sometimes we forget if we aren't close to people in the military? Yeah. Or um, first responders. Yeah, I think it cuts both ways. Um, yeah. My wife and I just hosted an event at our home a couple months ago. We had about two dozen widows here. We did a dinner for them. Um, and these widows varied from military widows to first responder widows. And unfortunately, um, the stories are very tragic. And these were, these were younger widows. These were like in their, I'd say, mid to late 20s. And some of them have young kids. And those kids will never see that. Typically, it was a father who passed. I think it was like 98% of them were, were men who had passed away. Um, and so there's a tragedy that that occurs in these family units as well because of these, these situations. And obviously the kids didn't choose for their mom or dad to serve, you know, a certain capacity. So it, it, it goes throughout generations too. So there's the individual obviously who goes to war, is in conflict or is in a shootout or fighting a fire and they come back from that tragedy, but it's the families um, that have to deal with the second, third order effects as well. And that can get passed along um, in, in not good ways um, through families too. To, to, to encapsulate, I think the, the best way for me to describe this, this may sound a little unorthodox, but it's also really the center of our, our organization and our mission at the foundation is that if you watch the movie Forrest Gump mm -hmm. and you watch the Lieutenant Dan character, which was played by Gary in that movie, and you watch how he went from being in the war to being saved by Forrest to going through a state of depression to coming out of that and having employment to then being married and finding somebody who is special for him. That cycle in that movie, I think, does an amazing job of describing the phenomenon of the commitment, the tragedy, the stress, the post traumatic stress the hope and the achievement. Unfortunately, um, there are veterans every single day who are committing suicide. There are police and fire who are doing the same. And to try and break that cycle, to say, how can we stop that and give people that vision of hope, like the Lieutenant Dan character had at the end of the movie, that's what we're about. It's to help people through that transition, to give them hope, to give them empowerment, to give them independence, to provide them a walk so they can achieve that state of being. To me, it's exactly where it's at the center of this foundation. Um, there's a Netflix series uh, that came out last year called The Movies That Made Us. And in season two, episode four, they did Forrest Gump. And in this series, what they do is they take a movie and they kind of tear it apart for an hour and talk about the business part of it and the actors and the casting and this and that. And as an outsider to Hollywood, I'm watching this going, this is pretty interesting. Um, I, I'm an analyst and a consultant. And so I'm watching this thing going, this is pretty fascinating. Well, at the, I'm not going to give you the whole story because I want you to go watch it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that show about Forrest Gump and the movies that made us, it tells a story exactly about why the foundation was started. Gary was the only actor who did not win an Academy Award in that, that movie. But Gary won a much bigger thing. And through his vision and perseverance and passion to help people, he started this foundation. He's touched millions of people. And I think it's truly through that walk that brings us here today for this discussion, but it also enables us to go help all these people in a state of need. And sometimes it's not an obvious need. These are invisible wounds mm -hmm. that clearly are not always physical. I think there can be correlations between the two. Um, but there's a lot of invisible wounds out there that we don't talk about and we don't see. <coughs> Excuse me. Still fighting a little bit cold here. Not COVID, but cold. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I think comes across with these invisible wounds is that as a nation, as a society, 
I think we're just literally right at the front end of starting to understand these things. I think it's starting to happen more and more um, in the literature and the medicine in the psychology of this. But one of the things we're going to try and do is to help push the needle on how to help more people with these invisible wounds, whether it's military or it's first responders. Um, there's, there's very similar phenomena. Again, I'm not a clinician in this regard, but just as somebody who's a lay person who reads it, who's trying to lead a mission to help those people, um, there's many different techniques and ways to approach this. Um, the data is still being discussed right now, I think is the best way to say it. Um, medical schools do not train doctors to deal with these things, the specific kind of issue necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it's a gap issue amongst many different kinds of situations. So, but it's also one of the most important issues because we have these people walking around in our society who could be like that Lieutenant Dan and be like this hugely successful contributing person mm -hmm. to give back to people, mm -hmm. you know, and not just for them, but for all these other people in their lineage and other people in their community. Yeah. You know, Mike, this is very, it's both very distressing to me and it's also very exciting to me. And I can't help but think about, there's a quote from Maya Angelou. Um, mm -hmm. And she said, there's no greater, um, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you, right? Where everything is like locked up. And this idea of invisible wounds is like, I hate it so much that there's, um, that there's so much that isn't being said and isn't being expressed. And that has the ability to change lives. Um, we had a, one of the Oklahoma city firefighters, Oklahoma city bombing, who's, um, one of the first people on the scene when that happened uh, a couple of decades ago, Chris Fields. And he had, he was kind of sharing his story and he started something called trauma behind the badge. Mm -hmm where he talks with other first responders about what they've experienced um, just in their work for, um, for their, their cities or wherever. Yeah. And really powerful things that you wouldn't, you don't see because people put on this face of yeah. normalcy. I'm doing air quotes for people who can't see me. Normalcy <laughs> and strength, right? Because it's perceived as a weakness. Um, when in reality, Mike, you know this, I know you know this more than I do even, that our weakness is what leads to the, our greatest strength, right? Like that's what makes us human that could help us to um, more identify with other people. And so what, what is the answer to all of this? I'm asking you the million dollar question right now. Yeah. How do we become people who help others unlock their stories what are, how do we become those type of people who are trustworthy and open spaces where people can feel like yes i can say anything yeah um that is a million dollar question <laughs> I, I think um as i'm getting older I, i'm getting closer to an answer i think um I think we all evolve towards an answer. I, I think part of it is a uh, is an empathy towards our fellow humans. <laughs> um, when I when I think about one of the things my last mission taught me, where I was a CEO of Bethesda Lutheran Communities, was that um, it doesn't matter what your IQ is. Um, it's all about grace, and it's about goodness, and it's about how you can help other people and how much people really appreciate help. Mm -hmm. And they may not be able to necessarily articulate that to you in terms that you may understand, especially in our society. Um, and the world that I came from in my previous mission, which was a totally different mission than being a national security analyst um, or a consultant at a big four consulting firm. One of the things that I saw in that was um, people that we took care of, they may not be able to talk they may not be able to open their eyes. Um, they may not be able to move their hands, but you could sense love. Mm. And I think there's a sense that, especially amongst the caretakers that we that I worked alongside of, that they knew that person's love. They knew when they were sad. They knew when they were happy. They knew a different dimension of emotions and empathy. And I think, I think one of the things that I'm learning as I get older 
is that you have to be more empathetic and you have to take a step back and you have to understand people's walk and be able to understand more about where they came from and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, one of the things I love about the military is that we all came from different walks. Um, my roommate at the academy was multi-generation service academy grad. I came from a family where my dad and grandfather hung wallpaper and painted buildings, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it, but it doesn't matter because we all got to that same place. We got through, through different avenues. Um, but to me, it was about service and empathy. And when I look at Gary's story, same thing. You know, he, he grew up in Highland Park, Illinois, started his own acting company called Steppenwolf in Chicago, which is now wildly mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. um, Gary had a, had a uh, after 9-11, was motivated to want to really dig in and help people. Mm -hmm. And I think for each of us, there's different triggers and different effects. For me, my trigger was, I think, really my last job. Even though I served the military for 20 some odd years, it wasn't until I was confronted with people who I didn't fully understand, I had to take a step walk back. I didn't have anybody in my family who had Down syndrome or autism. And so to get in there to serve people and help people from a different walk um, truly made a difference in my mind shift of like, what does it take to help people? Mm -hmm. And I think every one of us goes through that differently. You know, so again, you can get from A to B much differently um, based on where you're walking from. But um, I love how you guys are pulling on this thread. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important thread to pull on. I think, especially in the context of where we're at right now and the challenges we have, I think it's about love. I think it's about loving people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even when you may not necessarily be required to love, I think it's about loving people yeah. and, and following that, that command of just, you know, take care of people, even if they may not understand it. Um, one last thing about our mission here is uh, again, when I go back to the Forrest Gump movie and I watched the Lieutenant Dan character in this, I just watched with my kids over Christmas again mm -hmm. and they hadn't seen it before. And they're young adults now. I say kids, but they're really young adults. They hadn't mm -hmm. seen it before. And there was a scene in that movie where Forrest is trying really, really hard to help Lieutenant Dan. Forrest is just a nice human being, right? He's just kind of an innocent and he's trying to help people. And there's one part where you can literally see in Gary Sinise's eyes and Lieutenant Dan's eyes, something snaps. And he realizes that this guy who saved him, who's now helping him and taking care of him, loves him. And you never hear that word in the movie, but you can see the emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point where the, character, the Lieutenant Dan character goes from being dark and negative and really depressed to there's a future. Mm -hmm. There's a couple moments here where he's talking to God and on the mast of that ship, <laughs> but it's really, it's that flip. And I think what flips it is that unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And we can get into that mode as human beings. I think we can serve a lot of people and do it in a wonderful way. Yeah. I think Mike, that um, I, I keep going back to your quadrant of smart and good, smart and good people. And um, three other questions won't talk about <laughs> we won't talk about the other ones um but like i keep thinking like what you're saying is really it's pushing home the point of that we are all what love as basic as it seems and kindness as basic as they seem are actually the keys to unlocking our bigger problems and mm -hmm. um and so i think we all would benefit from really kind of looking at ourselves and saying, how am I loving? How am I being kind? Those are not secondary values. Mm -hmm. Like they're first level values that then can lead us to lead, lead smarter lives and to use our brains to make this world better because we authentically love people. And we realize that we're all equal, right? Like they're, We've created, you know, hierarchies of people mm -hmm. based on position, based on wealth, based on education, yeah. whatever. And in reality, mm -hmm. we all have something to offer the world and we all have something to get from other people to give to other people. Um, and it's like you said, the decentralized thing is critical. Like we all have this part to play. Um, Mike, I could go on and on because like my brain is full of questions, but we, we're going to wrap it up here. And I'm just going to say thank you for joining thank us you. on the podcast. I think this was incredible. Um, and it's a good reminder for the start of 2022 for all of us to press into service, to press into love, 
to press into kindness and to look for ways to do that. And um, uh, Anne and I are both really grateful for your work with the foundation and your service over the years and keep going, keep going. We're just gonna cheer you on all the way. Um, and thank you. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed it, like it, share it with others. And we'll see you guys throughout the year. Bye.